Hello, folks. Welcome back. Welcome back. So uh, now we have uh, Jason Nevis, as in Ben Nevis, kind of, uh, from Tick. So Tyke, sorry. Tyke. Not a problem. Take it a lot, away. A lot of people get confused with that. Take it away. Yeah, thank you. How's everybody doing today? I hope you've been having a good conference so far. Uh, and I actually see a couple of faces I've recognized and, and may have talked to earlier today. So today we're going to be touching on um, somewhat of a sensitive topic with some people. Uh, whether you reinvent or renovate your APIs and your infrastructure in order to support new open banking strategies. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself. I am Jason Nevis, as he just said. Uh, I work with Tyke. Uh, I've been with Tyke now for uh, approximately four months, but I've also been a consumer of Tyke uh, for about four years, uh, almost since the company's inception. Uh, my previous employer that I was with was actually uh, a customer of Tyke, so I know quite a bit about a product and API management in general. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I was formerly at USA Today, which is what most of you will probably know the company named as. Uh, it's also known as Gannett. Uh, I was a principal developer and also the manager of the cluster operations team, which was responsible for basically the entire Kubernetes infrastructure at Gannett. Uh, I've been in this industry for a little over 30 years, so you could say I've seen a lot, both good and bad. So again, you may have seen some of our stickers from upstairs. Uh, each one of these represents a software release. We've got plenty more of this. Uh, we've got a very cool in-house designer that does all of these. Uh, so feel free to stop up at the booth and come get our, some of our cool stickers. So again, Tyke API management. Um, we're basically going to be touching on how to make boring industry or boring interesting, interesting, yeah, sorry, throat's dry, and interesting dangerous. So let's go ahead and touch on the current industry right now. So uh, how many of you right now are software developers or have been a software developer? Just give me a, a quick show of hands. Okay, good number of you. So how many of you are Python developers? Got a couple. Uh, Java developers, yeah, a lot more. Or JavaScript, you know, people doing Node. Okay, so good number of you that were software developers, pretty familiar with all of those. How many of you are Go developers? Eh, we've got a couple more. Uh, how about Kotlin? Not too many. Erlang? Again, very, very cutting edge, sometimes not too well known technologies. So, as you can see by the graph here, you know, everyone that has basically risen their hand is all in that top tier there. And if we take a look at this graph here, you can see many of those are on the high end of the more popular languages. And if you take a look at the uh, GitHub commits and users, you see all of those, JavaScript, Python, Java, uh, a little C++, a little C and C Sharp. Uh, one that's not shown on here because this is actually a fairly uh, older graph is Go. And that's one that's actually uh, considerably on the uptick now, uh, as you showed by a uh, show of hands that's pretty much uh, much more popular nowadays. And if you bear with me for one second, my notes are actually not moving along with the slides here. All right, that's fine. So boring is good. Sticking with the status quo is good. It's dependable. You have a large talent pool to pull from. You have distributed seniority. You have an increased supply, which means it's much more affordable. Widespread best practices are already in place because people have been using these languages for so long. And boring is good for team churn. You get people leave. You don't have to sit there and struggle to replace a developer that has been working with an obscure technology. You can just go ahead, jump in, and go. So speaking of Go, Tyke itself is written on the Go programming language. It's written by our founder, Martin. Uh, back in 2014 to solve a problem that uh, he had, he decided to write it in Go. Only problem is, look, back then, there really weren't that many Go developers. So 
he was pretty much maintaining it himself. He was running it himself. And the talent pool to continue to maintain it really didn't exist yet. You had to bring in new people and train them in order to use Go. So let's talk about a different subject here. Every team has one of these. The mad scientist, the Doc Brown. You know, the one thing that I like to say when it comes to Doc Browns is like, oh, hey, Kelsey Hightower just tweeted out something about no code. How can we get that to production next week? Well, eh, no code is, is, you know, it's great and all, but it's not for everyone. So what these guys are good for, though, is they're good for innovating. These are the guys that you throw on your R&D team and you say, hey, I have a brand new project. I want you to find the perfect solution for it. These guys are your researchers. You don't put these guys on your front end because the minute you put them on your front end, you're in trouble. So let's talk about a little bit of history. Uh, there we go. So many years ago, back in the Roman era, Caesar would come back from his conquests and they'd have what's called a triumph. Big parades, big celebrations, and everyone would be running around crazy. What you would have with the military commanders, which were called the ducks, they would have a man that would follow them. They were usually the charioteer or some type of chaperone that would hang out with them. They would, call, they would be called the origa. And the origa had a single job. He was there to follow that commander and whisper in his ear, momento mori, or sometimes momento homo, which basically means you are merely just a man or you're merely mortal. And sometimes I wish we had someone like that on our development teams that would sit there behind the mad scientist and say, hey, chill out. You know, you need to focus and get yourself in order and remember, this is your job. You can be fired. You're mortal. You know, you're replaceable. So what does this mean? Does this mean I'm out of touch? You know, I'm, I'm kind of set in my ways. You know, I've been in this industry for 30 years. Am I crazy? Not really. It just means I'm careful. I like to do my due diligence, and I like to make sure that things are done in an orderly fashion. So with that, Let's go ahead and jump into the first technology here that I'm going to talk about. Serverless. Everybody loves serverless right now. So <clears throat> what does serverless do? Deploy functions to a third-party cloud and have them run only when needed, and then build your entire application that way. Everybody loves serverless. Everybody talks about how ingrained is your application into the serverless world. Everybody wants to run everything serverless. Write once, deploy anywhere. Many people see these already, serverless, Apex, Squeezer, which really isn't serverless, it's more of a blockchain uh, as a service, uh, which again, if, this, if nobody in this talk has heard blockchain yet, there you go, you've heard it already. And all of these sit on top of your Lambda, your cloud functions, or any other type of cloud function service, so with their frameworks. Well, where have we seen this before? Anybody remember mobile development? Mobile developers, we had iOS, we had Android, we had Windows Phone, we had Blackberry. Well, in order to write for all of those, everybody wanted to write once, deploy anywhere. So we had all of these software companies that popped up to solve that problem for us. But then what happened? Well, Windows Phone doesn't exist anymore. BlackBerry doesn't exist anymore. So now we've got just iOS and Android. Well, what does that do with all of our frameworks? Well, why do you need those frameworks anymore? Just write native. Write iOS, write Android. You have two flavors to write for, and you're done. Now, many of these companies don't exist anymore. Some of them still do, but they've transformed themselves into um, slightly different mobile platforms. They still are frameworks to some extent. They make your life easier, but do you really need them? Another thing you talk about with serverless, lock-in. 
So I love this picture right here. So you get your Lambda. OK, great. I've got my Lambda. I've got a couple of cloud functions out there. Great. They're doing their job. Well, now all of a sudden, I need to take some of those Lambda functions, and I need a data store for them. Well, close to the edge, I'm going to grab DynamoDB. Well, now I need a little bit more functions. I need some messaging. I need messaging between my microservices. So now I'm going to grab SQS. Great. Well, now I need some caching. Let's grab Elastic Cache. Starting to see a pattern here. You're getting locked into whatever vendor you chose for that serverless function. Pretty much, you're not serverless. You're buying more servers to perform that same function. They're just not your servers. You don't manage them. You, own, you don't own them. They're just run by somebody else. You know, something I like to say, people talk about the cloud. The cloud is really just running your workloads. You just don't own the servers anymore. It's somebody else's problem. So what is serverless good for? Throw away prototypes. You need to prototype a function. You need to figure out if something works. Write your serverless. Throw it up there. Test it out. Great. Now take that, pull it back, and write it into your service natively. Repeated reporting tasks, or even repeated admin functions. Uh, at my last job, we actually had a lot of serverless functions that we tossed out there to do, to do a lot of file system management. You know, S3, S3 bucket is, is filling up somewhere. Um, we need to be able to prune that easily. We threw out functions out there that would take a look at the data, analyze it real quick. Is it something that can be deleted? Delete it, and off it goes. Quick serverless function. Or nano services. You know, very similar to something that I just described. So this is a, a nice little poem that was written uh, by our CEO last year, because uh, I'm stealing a little bit from his talks. And uh, I'd love to read this one to you. So a serverless can be a server more, as Lambda and Cloud Function do not bore. But solid design, yes, solid design, will be forever. Generic abstractions to the dark side lead. And there are the sharks of lock-in feed. So take the step, but choose wisely. For to shrink your bill is mighty unlikely. So again, when it comes to serverless, choose, but choose wisely. So let's go on to our second discussion here. Microservices. Everybody loves microservices. Increase the complexity of your application and runtime environment by an order of magnitude with this one simple trick. So here's a microservice setup that one of our engineers found online. And this is basically their shopping cart application. You've got your shopping cart, which is backed by MySQL. Then you've got a ratings app and a review app and all the different functions of your shopping cart. Well, let's take a look at that and break it down. It's a shopping cart. You've got two database types. You've got two programming languages. You've got a distributed schema. And hopefully, things stay consistent. It's like, what's the point of using microservices for this? Here's another one. So this one probably hits a little closer to home to a lot of people uh, in the audience here. This is 1,500 microservices, and each one of those lines represent an enforced network rule between all of them. It works for them. This is, this is actually an ideal setup for them. It all sits on top of Kubernetes. They've orchestrated their deployments, so everything is all automated. They have their GitHub all in place. This is all great. But it takes 150 engineers plus to manage this. And if you don't know who this is or what the banking app is on your phone, uh, you could probably find this image doing a reverse image lookup, and you'll find it on Twitter. So do you have insane scale? Well, these guys do. Is your availability really that bad? Do you need super high availability? Do you have the resources to dedicate a team to every single microservice that you're putting out there? And have you hired a microservice expert to help you? Do you have a designer in there with your people to help them out? So again, there's nothing new here. That shopping cart, build it as a monolith. 
but build it well. If you do need microservices, strip them into domains that make sense for a microservice. And don't run microservice first because you'll triple your go-to-market time. So this is a fun one that I like to talk about. I know I'll probably get a lot of uh, ugly faces and, and arguments later on on this one, but GraphQL. So let's add a SQL layer in front of your decoupled services to recouple the decoupled layer into a single interface to make interface developers happy. Kind of sounds like a, a show from MTV a while ago. So let's break this down. Let's use microservices for high availability. Awesome. Let's use microservices for localized complexity and failure isolation. Awesome. Let's use microservices for faster service iteration and innovation. Awesome. Let's use microservices to future-proof my application. Mind blown. How can I screw this up? Let's use microservices so we can use GraphQL. So again, simple microservice setup. You've got your gateways, you've got your services, you've got your databases. Best tool for the job. Isolated failure. Independently scalable. Focused productivity. This is an awesome setup. Now what have you done? You've basically tossed all of your microservices, but now made a monolith because you put GraphQL on top of it. You're introducing a single point of failure. You have duplicate data schemas all across the board. If one of those microservices fails and goes down, you've now screwed up the entire return of the data that's coming from that query. You're treating your services like it's a database. It's like, why are you using services if you just need a database? And you can't predict all of the code paths, especially if you start getting really complex with the microservices and the relationships through your GraphQL queries. So GraphQL, great for interface developers, but really not much else. So API design is not application design, but good application design can yield good API design. So again, take all of this with a grain of salt. You know, I know GraphQL, we, there's a whole track on it tomorrow. Um, I'm actually going to a couple of those myself to learn more about it. It has its purpose, but it's not the end all be all solution of everything. And with that, I am Jason. You all have a great day. Thank you, Jason. Uh, questions? 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 Uh, come on, who wants to ask a question about Go or GraphQL or something? All right. Then, Silence is golden. Then, come on, one more? One question or no? No. Yeah? No hands. Okay, then we're good. One more. Oh, we had one course, question please. over there. Oh, he does? Yes. The white <laughs> handkerchief. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for good presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. Thanks. Uh, so, the quick question, right? So, so you showed this this kind of microservices and monoliths, which which I think it's it's kind of fair assumption and and, and, and comparison here. But you know, when do you think is is a, is a good time to break into microservices? Uh, because there, there is there is a kind of use case for those, right? So, so when do you think is 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 the time? And another question, kind of aligned to that, is how do you think uh, organization structure relates to that, based on your experience? Um, let me let me actually flip that real quick. So, as far as um, organization structure is concerned, uh, it does make a considerable difference. Um, there are concepts of, in some organizations, again, the, the former employer that I was with, Gannett, um, we had a lot of silos. And those silos were created just because of the simple fact that some of the development teams didn't like each other. They didn't like talking with each other. They just liked doing their own thing. So they would write their microservices and then publish documentation for it. And then the other team would write their microservices and publish documentation for it. But the good thing about it, 
is that because they were siloed, they didn't talk to each other too much, but they published their correct documentation for their microservices, that stuff could still get integrated later on down the road. Now, it's not ideal, but it does work. But it also works when you have um, a more unified team that then doles out um, you know, individuals that are responsible for certain microservices. And obviously, you want to have overlap. You, know, you have two guys over here that work on one microservice, two guys over here that work on another microservice, and maybe some overlap between one or two of those guys where they know enough about this microservice, and if one person's unavailable, they can jump in and, and help out. So from team organization, it's concerned. Um, it really honestly depends on how well the people get along, how large is your microservice infrastructure, how many microservices do you have? And that kind of goes into your next question. Where do you define the line between when do you use a microservice and when do you use a monolith? And that really comes down to where do you delineate your um, data, like where does your data live? Where does it need to live? What kind of separation do you need in your data types? Um, there may be some places, let's use the, the shopping cart as an example. That shopping cart really didn't need those microservices for reviews, for comments, for anything like that. All of that could pretty much be done in a monolith. But let's take a banking app, for example. Well, you may want to have a microservice that's out there that is for um, balances, for your actual like consumer banking. But then another set of microservices that deal only with loans. And then you have your customers that are another microservice in the middle, and you tie all that stuff together. So it, it really depends on how you have data separation defined in your organization and within your application. That's where you draw the lines. Thanks. Any other questions? Mm, no. Nope. Okay, then a big round for Jason Bevis. Thank, Thank you, Jason.